Thank you so much for the invitation. So yeah, that's my title. But uh, really, this is a meditation on Tate's conjecture and some of its consequences. So uh, to begin, I'd like to review uh, the Tate conjectures as a prologue. Okay. So let's suppose I've got two algebraic varieties, projective varieties, over a field k, which is presumed to be finitely generated. Mm -hmm. Then I define a space of cycles relating x to y. I'm not going to tell you about the most general form of Tate's conjecture, just a form that I'm going to need. So here we go. Uh, let's say they're both, I mean, this is a very special case. Let's suppose both are dimension d. They have this. Yeah, varieties is all of those nice adjectives. <laughs> Finite type and, yeah, smooth if you like, yeah. So uh, z is going to be, OK, so z, d, x, y. I need some coefficient field, which will be l -latic, and l should not divide the characteristic of k. Well, l should not be equal to the characteristic of k. How about that? Uh, so this will be the QL vector space on on correspondences. Uh, Z mapping to x to y like this. Uh, so uh, this will also have dimension d, right? That's the way I've set it up. So given such a correspondence, I can take cohomology classes of x and like push them into y via pull back and push forward. And uh, yeah, uh -huh. x should be smooth in this situation, yeah. Yeah, so variety will mean smooth variety, yeah. And uh, hmm. so uh, oh, I may use a notation for this situation. Uh, an element of this vector space, I might write such a thing as x. It's kind of like a morphism in a category of motives, so I may write it this way. There is a map from, as I just said, from the space of cycles to. All right, so I can take each of my varieties, x and y, and base change them to x bar. Oh, I don't need L. I just here. Yeah. Yes and yes. Okay. Uh, yes. So everything here is defined over K. So the map going here will be equivariant for the action of GK, and the f Tate's conjecture predicts that this map is surjective. So some kind of coincidence between the Galois representations that you get here has to be explained by the appearance of algebraic cycles. So uh, well, yeah, this is really a wonderful set of conjectures. I can just say something like for d equals 1, this is a theorem uh, by Zarhin. Uh, from a number theory point of view, let me just talk about one consequence of this. Uh, having to do with the modularity of elliptic curves, something that number theorists are familiar with. So an important consequence let's suppose E over Q is an elliptic curve. Right? And when we say that an elliptic curve over Q is modular, what does that actually mean? So uh, So the theorem proved by Wiles et al. is that E is modular in the following sense. I mean, there's, you could just say there is an, a, a modular form that corresponds to this E such that certain L functions agree. Another way of saying that exact thing is the sense that is, uh, is that E over Q is modular. Sorry. Yeah. Well, imagine the map went actually, imagine that uh, z was equal to y, and then now it's a map from y to x. And then do you agree that there is such a map like this? So this is just a, 
bit of a slight generalization of that idea. Were you concerned about Tate twists or something? Right. So this, yeah, so that's right. So this is D, yeah, it's D here. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the only case that I need in this talk. Yeah. So in modular, in what sense? Uh, that um, well, let's suppose n is the conductor of E, and what I mean is that the cohomology, the H one of E. Uh, so this, by the way, is the dual to the Tate module of E. This is a sum end of the cohomology of a modular curve as a representation of the Galois group of Q. And so uh, if it's modular in this sense, what is the consequence under Tate's conjecture? Well, there's got to be a correspondence between the two curves, x0 of n and E in that sense. And you can actually improve that to say that there's going to be a surjection from you know, what's known as a modular uniformization, x0 of n to e. It's a special fact that since e is a curve of genus 1, that you can improve a correspondence between curves into an actual map from one curve into the other. So this is, uh, and then this is quite, OK, so when you say an elliptic curve is modular, you kind of mean both things at once. But it's important to understand that it's Tate's conjecture that gets you from here to here. And then this thing is quite important. If I call this u for uniformization, um, you know, a consequence is that we have certain special points on this. So for k over q quadratic imaginary, we have certain Hegner points. And I call them xi, xi inside of x0 of n of k. And I can let pk be the image of such a thing. Now I have special points on E and the famous theorem of gross Zagier says that the derivative of the L function of E over k at 1 is related up to some non-zero constant to the height of this point pk. OK. This is this fabulous theorem, uh, which has implications for the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, right? Uh, which has, predicts a uh, relationship between the L function and the rank of the curve. But uh, one limitation of this, I should mention, is that this really is only interesting when the analytic rank of E over K is less than or equal to 1. So when the elliptic curve has some higher rank, like 2 or above, the Hegner point will just be 0. And so you're just getting 0 equal to 0. It's nothing so helpful. Of course, we would like some, app, some generalization of this, which works for higher rank elliptic curves. Over number fields, I have no idea what that is. But over function fields, we have some idea of what that is. It's kind of what this talk is going to be about. So I'm going to switch gears. Now we're going to talk about function fields. So let's start. Question so far? Tate's conjecture? OK. So I'd better start with some notation. So let's say I have a function field. So this is corresponding to a curve over a finite field. Finite field is FQ. Curve means uh, projective and geometrically connected over FQ and smooth. And uh, the function field, I'll call it K. All right. So I mentioned the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture for elliptic curves. Over function fields, it's long been known that the the Tate conjecture already implies BSD for elliptic curves over a function field k. You apply the Tate conjecture to, well, when you have an elliptic curve over k, that corresponds to an elliptic surface fibered over x, and you're applying Tate's conjecture to that surface. Uh, right. So I mean, that's 
the, the more broad version of Tate's conjecture involving you know, Galois, Galois invariant cycles inside of H1, uh, uh, sorry, H2 of that surface. So, uh, so that's one thing I'm going to mention. That's one bullet point. Um, maybe I'm going to resume writing this over here. The story that's written on this side of the board does have an analog for function fields having to do with, well, Drainfeld modules. <laughs> so uh, the story of modularity of elliptic curves over function fields, in one sense, it, you can really replicate it. So let's suppose I'm given a point, a closed point of the curve x. I'll call it a point at infinity. And let's say a is functions defined everywhere else with that point. So yeah, so spec A is this dense open inside of X. So, so there's some analog of the modular curve X naught of n. I'm going to write it this way, X naught of n, but I'm going to decorate it with infinity to indicate the importance of infinity of this point. And uh, this is a, a curve over A. <laughs> if I've got an elliptic curve over the function field K, and this has split multiplicative reduction at the point infinity, then E is modular in kind of both senses described here owing to Tate's conjecture. There exists, an, again, this modular uniformization of E like so, dot, dot, dot. Um, dot, 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 meaning you can recreate everything that's going on in this story with Hegner points and whatnot. So that's nice. It, again, not going to tell you much in the case of higher rank elliptic curves, though. However, um, this admits some generalizations which don't exist in the number field case. So for that, that we have to talk about moduli spaces of Stukas. OK. So the next bullet point goes like this. Uh, so let's say r is at least 1. <laughs> uh, there, oh, yeah, I also need to pick. Uh, Oh, this n, I didn't tell you what this n is. n is not an integer in this story here. n is going to be the conductor of E, but that conductor is a, is a divisor. It's an effective divisor. The one direction is not in the function field. In both BSD, right? Both BSD direction. Yeah, what is the status of B for elliptic curves over function fields? So let's say we don't assume Tate's conjecture. What we have is that a certain inequality. If the rank is r, the algebraic rank, then the analytic rank is at least r. The equality is equivalent to the finiteness of Shah in that case. So it, it, the status is definitely much better than it is for number fields. OK. There's a theorem in it when, when the rank bigger than 1. It exists a one-way theorem in general, which doesn't exist. Uh, sorry, there exists a inequality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in the number field case, we certainly don't. Yes, that's, that's right. So I mean, I guess the moral is cycles are just hard to produce. Yeah. So let r be greater than equal to 1. Um, so the analog or the generalization of this space, of this, of this curve, this Strindfeld modular curve. Oh, I should say this is a curve. But the next thing I'm going to write down is certainly not a curve. Um, it's going to be a scheme. Uh, I want n to be big enough, a big enough divisor. Then there exists um, a scheme. And I'm going to write it SHT for Stukas. R, OK. So R is like the number of legs, so to speak. And I'm going to copy the rest of the notation. So I'm going to say Stukas not of n. And it's fibered over the R fold product of x. Okay. So the way this is pronounced is. Yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this is the moduli space of rank 2 Stukas with R legs. And uh, with uh, gamma naught of n level structure. Mm. So, uh, 
So um, what does this mean? Well, I'm not going to tell you precisely, because that would take a kind of big chunk of this talk. But it, roughly speaking, this classifies vector bundles of rank 2, e over x, together with a map phi from the Frobenius pullback of e to itself. The map may have, uh, so it's an isomorphism away from finitely many points. And those points are the r points here. So this map is an isomorphism. away from r points. OK. Why are they called, they called legs? It's, uh, I don't know, but it's uh, <laughs> for just a moment. It's a question. This question should be addressed to Laurent Lafourque. Lafourque, OK. Yeah. Laurent. Laurent Lafourque, OK. No, uh, maybe Vincent Lafourque. Then Vincent just uh, Right. Well, uh, he, had to, he needed some noun to represent both 0 and Pole, and, right. Well, you can call it singularity, but it would be lost. So I don't right. know like. Well, I like it. I mean, Actually, we already, French yeah. Bots, uh, yes. which is uh, translated as pause in English. OK. Yeah. OK, great. Um, so I didn't, I, I'm not fully explaining the details on this. I mean, the nature of the failure to be an isomorphism must be restricted. Um, so, uh, oh, I didn't say what level structure meant either. The level structure is a trivialization of the restriction of the vector bundle to the divisor n. So I mean this. Right. So if you like, r should be even, and then it's more or less as I describe it. If you want to include odd r, uh, the recent paper, well, 2015 paper of Yun and Zhang tell you how to do this. I'm not going to describe that here. But you are more or less Yes. So no yes, correct, correct. And for this talk, I'm going to stick with that situation. So if you like, r should be even. And all of my examples will just be r equals 2 anyway. OK. okay. <laughs> uh, and when you got two legs. Two legs, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, all right, so for what I'm going to say next, We'll have to do with the cohomology of this, this moduli space, just as the cohomology of modular curves was involved there. Um, in brief, uh, you know, since the thing is fibered over x to the r, it's going to be useful to me to talk about the generic point. All right, so this is the r-fold product of x over the base field fq. So that's an integral scheme. So the generic point of it, I'm going to call it kr. So that k1 is k. <laughs> Then if I, I can go ahead and write down something like the cohomology of the space of Stuckas, uh, base changed up to this generic point, but I want the geometric generic point. So that cohomology space, so OK, there are some details I'm omitting. This thing is not a finite type. I have to truncate it first. Um, but, but anyway, after some pruning is done, I can take the cohomology of this, and then it'll, of, co of course, have an action of the Galois group of this field Kr. Now, what is the Galois group of this field? Um, so I mean, it's not quite the same as our copies of the Galois group of the generic point here, x. But, but there is at least a map from the Galois group of Kr to the r copies of the Galois group of K. And uh, so that map is not an isomorphism. The Kunis isomorphism for topological spaces does not hold for schemes over a finite field. But uh, the miracle, which is known as Drinfeld's lemma, is that the action here actually factors through an action here. So it's really this group that is acting. So we have an action of R copies of the Galois group of K on this cohomology. So, uh, now I'm going to continue over here. So you mentioned Laforg. OK. Hmm. So I'm erasing right now what it meant for our elliptic curve to be modular. 
Um, but let me just say what happens when you have an elliptic curve over k. So if e over k has conductor n, then this cohomology, hr, has as a sum and Oh, no. Where did I do it? So x is e. No, e is now an elliptic curve over k. Oh, okay. Yeah, e is an elliptic curve over k, right. So what, what, So the, um, you know, we already know that the L function of e, for instance, has an analytic continuation, et cetera, because it's just a polynomial. Uh, uh, so it's modular in kind of this analytic sense. And it's not hard to, uh, OK, right. So th given what is known about the cohomology of this, uh, owing to Drinfeld and Laforgue, we can say that this contains as a sum end um, R, the rth tensor product of the cohomology of E. So I'm going to take E, base change it to k bar um, over QL, and then I'm going to tensor this with itself r times. And in doing so, I obtain a vector space of dimension 2r with an action of r copies of the Galois group. And that's, this is a sum and of this. OK. So two to the power of r. Two to, what did I say? Two to, two to the power of r. Right. Again, when r equals 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this thing fits, just sits inside. I mean, it's itself a sum and of hr of er. So e to the r. I suppose e to the r. So e lives over x, and then I can take the generic fiber of it over kr, and then take, take this. So yeah, OK. So we've got these two varieties over kr. And when I base change them to oops, kr bar and take the cohomology, there's this relation between them. So there is a map from here to here. So that indicates that there should be a correspondence. So Tate would say, uh, under Tate's conjecture, there exists some kind of correspondence from the space of Stuckas 2, and this is this funny symbol indicating correspondences uh, to R copies of E. And so did not someone think of this before me? They must have. I don't know, but I'm speaking publicly about it. <laughs> I don't know. So it seems like a pretty natural thing to want. And Tate's conjecture predicts it, so we might as well investigate it. There's nothing. It's just nothing specific about E being an elliptic curve. E, I could replace E with a abelian variety of whatever dimension. That would be fine, too. OK. So um, what am I doing next? Uh, right. So I, I suppose now it's time for me to talk about the work of Yun Zhang, because that's what inspired this whole effort. Um, started here. So since we now have this uniformization, well, we don't have it. But under Tate's conjecture, we do. Uh, then we should get these interesting Hegner points. But they don't live on E itself. They live on R copies of E. So I'm just going to write down what should happen. OK. Um, hmm. Yes. Uh, so this paper of Yun Zhang. 15. They study a class of cycles, which they call Drinfeld Hegner cycles. And uh, I guess I want to write it as psi k prime. And this is an R cycle inside of the space of Stuka's R like this, uh, except I now have to replace this with k prime R. What's going on here? So k prime over k is quad, uh, quadratic extension, any quadratic extension. And so after base changing, then there are these cycles that appear. There are cycles inside of the space, just as a classical modular curve has Hegner points. Now we have R cycles. And if you do have this correspondence, then you could push the cycle into the elliptic curve. But now it's in R copies. So let me just let PK prime. Hmm, be uh, the image of this psi k prime 
under this uniformization. And so now this lives in, it's an R cycle inside of the R fold product of E over K prime R, like that. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so the, th the formula proved by Yun and Zhang concerns L functions. And instead of just the first derivative, it's the Rth derivative. So I can take the elliptic curve, base extended to k prime, and take the L function. I take the rth derivative, and this should be related to, up to some non-zero explicit constant, the height of this point pk prime. Right. So this was the shocking thing about Yun Zhang's work. It really gives a formula for an arbitrary derivative of the L function, even those past the critical value. So this L function normalizes, right? Oh, yeah. That's what I mean by this dot. <laughs> yeah, some kind of normalized L function. But the normalization factors are not deep. They're not too difficult. Uh, in particular, they're the same, they're the same for R, different values of R. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, oh, yeah. So I think an important question is, um, well, I just, I just want to spell out the expectation when it comes to the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. So let's suppose E over k prime has algebra, uh, uh, yeah, analytic rank exactly R and that this thing u exists. Then we've got this Hegner point. Well, what do we expect to happen? At this time, I am talking about the critical value. And that should be related to a, a u, um, regulator, so like a, deriv a determinant of height pairings like this. Well, everything would follow very nicely if we knew that uh, this pk prime, oh, yeah, yeah. So the thing that we expect, it, looking in this biggest space. yeah. Sorry, the points live in where? Uh, in that construction, mm. uh, I'm just trying to relate the points okay, to this regulator. Yeah, regulator. That's about what I'm, that's about what I'm about to say. So uh, we expect that, you know, up to torsion elements. Uh, the mord alve group should be spanned by R points. And what's the relation between this set of points and this pk prime? Well, I expect pk prime to be some non-zero multiple of like the determinant of them. So I mean, here, I'm going to write it this way. Yeah. So what do I mean by this? I mean, given these points, each of them really is a one cycle inside of the elliptic surface E. I can mash them together to get an R cycle inside of the E to the R. And then this symbol means sum that anti-symmetrically over all permutations. So it's like the determinant. And if this is true, then you could plug it into here, and then you get your regulator that way. So this is the sort of thing I expect to happen. Right. So I, you know, even, okay, so even under these hypotheses, I don't know how to prove this. I expect it'll be an interesting thing to study, though. Uh, th in this talk, I want to talk about just the existence of this map U. I got very curious. Can we even come up with one example? Right. So again, since R is 1, it's not quite the definition I gave. But um, in the souped up definition, you do get a Drinfeld modular curve where we know, where we do know things. That's right. Uh, tells you that there exists right. It's not a very effective. Right. Well, it's a pretty indirect part. 
Right. It's an indirect argument. The existence of this kind of modular uniformization, oh, I erased it. The existence of the modular uniformization, even in R equals 1 case, is pretty indirect. It relies on Zarhan. Oh, is this expectation reasonable? Well, this is exactly what's, it's kind of exactly what would be, uh, this is why I called it an expectation under BSD, because you expect the height on the right to be the height of this point. So the heights should agree. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm going to talk about one example. Do I go until 530? OK. Uh, so this is joint work with Noam Elkies. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to just really do in detail the simplest case possible. Q should be 2, of course. X should be P1. And then I want an elliptic curve of some conductor. Conductors of elliptic curves over P1, they have degree at least 4. So uh, here's a nice example. Uh, and then R will be 2. And well, yes, when R equals 1, and uh, well, then I'm talking about the Drenfeld modular curve, then that is an elliptic curve. So the uniformization of that elliptic curve is the identity map. It's a nice situation because there's only one cusp form at this level. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, and then K2, I'll call it, you know, you know, that's this was remember, this was the generic generic point of x cross x over fq. So it's f2 adjoined two variables. I'll call them p and q. The zero and the pole. OK. Uh, then in this case, uh, SHT2. All right. All right. So this is about this space. And I want to base change it to K2. And I also wanted to, I mean, there, there's many connected components to this, but I only want to take one of them. So that's what this symbol means. And then this is birational to a K3 surface. Uh, I'll tell you. I, well, <laughs> well <laughs> it basically because I found the equation and I recognized it as such. So, so this was a matter of finding the right param the, the right um, the right morphism from this to the projective line. In other words, the right function. And uh, the equation for this is as follows. You know, it's an elliptic surface. So it's an elliptic curve. And do you know how to write down an elliptic curve? You need five parameters to write down the Weierstrass equation. Here are those five parameters. P plus one. Q plus 1 T. That's my A1. Do, do, we, do you see where I'm going with this? All right. And then, uh, and then I'm going to take T plus P, T plus Q times A1. And that's my A2. So, what is so there's a map from this space of Stuka's, well, a rational map, to P1. This is a surface, and this is the projective line over T. So t is some very fortunately found parameter. It's a function on this. And uh, now I'm presenting this. So this is fibered over p1, and the fibers are elliptic curves. So uh, now that's what this t is. Uh, and then the next one would be a2 times. So. Three and then zero and zero and that's it. Okay, so a oh sorry, this is a two. This is a three, and a four and a six are both zero. So there is an elliptic vibration of the space of Stuckas, and uh, if you recognize, I mean, you can tell what the uh, Hodge diamond of an elliptic vibration is by looking at the degrees here, and this is just such that you get a K three surface. So it's a, an elliptic K three surface. Actually, such surfaces often have multiple elliptic vibrations. 
So this elliptic surface has rank 18. Its neuron severi group has rank 18. Uh, so it's ordinary. Rank 18, OK, OK, OK. Um, so, uh, uh, so I kind of sent this off to, I wanted to analyze this. I sent this off to Noam. And he actually found an interesting relation to this. So, um, so zero. If I, if you know, this is y squared plus yada yada yada, uh, because this last term is zero. Zero zero is a section of this. And this has uh, this is six torsion. So in fact, um, uh, this uh, uh, this space of Stukas is uh, is birational to. Uh, the universal elliptic K3, um, with the six torsion section, <laughs> through some coincidence. All right, fine. That's not the most important thing, but it's interesting. Uh, section. Uh, right, so maybe you're curious about where the elliptic curve comes in. So as I said before, there's exactly one elliptic curve at this level. So let's say EP over F2P. Uh, this is going to be, well, the Weierstrass equation looks like this. P0, P0, 0. This has conductor N. OK. So what's going on here? We have our uh, K3 surface here. And we have an elliptic curve. And we're hoping that the elliptic curve is modular in a sense that there should be a correspondence between this K3 surface and E cross E. Well, E cross E, how do I get a K3 surface out of that? I could pass to the Coomer surface. So I have another K3 surface. It's the Coomer surface of EP cross EQ. This is also a K3 over, I consider it over uh, this F2 adjoining P and Q. So what is the Coomer surface? It's you take EP cross EQ and you mod out by the action of negative 1, that involution. In odd characteristic or zero characteristic, there are 16 singular points, and you have to resolve them. This is characteristic two. Now there is four points of uh, singular points, but they're worse. You have to <laughs> desingularize more. But in any case, after you've done this, you get another K3 surface. So maybe, so I thought like, wow, maybe these two K3 surfaces are isomorphic. They're not. This is where I needed Noam's help. So, <laughs> so in fact, there exists a nine to one map from the space of Stukas then to this Coomer surface. And that's actually the desired correspondence between them. Um, yeah. Maybe you can see that you actually get a correspondence. Uh, you know, there's a map from EP cross EQ to this. Um, and so you could take the fiber product, and then that thing would map to both of them, and that would be your correspondence. So this elliptic curve is modular in the sense that when r equals 2, you get this. So I, I yeah, OK. I mean, I would love it if someone uh, could actually compute what the drinfeld hegner cycles are on EP cross EQ and try to figure out whether this expectation holds uh, for a twist of this elliptic curve, which has rank 2. I think, in theory, that should be possible. Um, it might be difficult. I think the file needed to write down this map is more than a megabyte. It's not easy. Yeah, it's, yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, if, if you're interested, you could ask me later how Noam found, how Noam found this. Okay. The man knows his K3 surfaces. Okay. All right, very good. So I expect the problem of. It does. In fact, it has a six torsion point. I think. EP does, yeah. I think, again, 0, comma 0 is it? Uh, well, it would be easy to find out, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I think the question of 
the question of the existence of a modular parameterization in this sense is kind of hard. So then after this, I wanted to switch gears to a slightly easier question. And that question has to do with uh, the phenomenon called Jacques Langlands. And so this last part of the talk is about Jacques Langland cycles. The question mark, because I don't know that they exist yet. <laughs> so uh, here's the setup. Uh, when you think of Jacquet Langlands for GL2, it's a comparison between two kinds of automorphic forms. One's on GL2, and one's coming from a quaternion algebra. So what I'm going to do is let D over FQT be the quaternion algebra ramified at exactly 0 and infinity. Yeah, I'm finished with that example. I guess there's one. I guess we also did. Yeah, I guess there's a coda, which is that we actually have two examples. The other one is the elliptic curve with this conductor. Then you get. Yeah, I would hope that someone who's very good at computers could. <laughs> To check this regulator question, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, right. So Noam also could handle this. This case, it's another elliptic curve. You again get two K three surfaces, but this time the map between them is four to one. Go figure. All right. So this is the quaternion algebra. Okay, good. So uh, I'll say here is that the H two of the surfaces. So there's a Stuka space uh, with again with two legs, and I'm going to do again the same level two zero plus one plus infinity. Oh, actually, I want to switch over so that one is in this role and zero is in this role. You'll see why in a second. Um, and then the other one has to do with you know D Stukas, whatever that means. So, um, you know, just as modular curves have Shimura curves, where you use as the input some quaternion algebra rather than GL2, uh, Stuckas can have the same structure. There are split Stuckas like these, and then there's also D Stuckas. And the cohomologies should be related because the automorphic forms for the two groups are in correspondence. Especially when I set it up this way, if you're a D Stucke, uh, the cohomology of that should correspond to automorphic representations of D star. And those correspond to representations of GL2, which um, have like Iwahori level structure at these two ramified places. So that's why it's these two that are in correspondence. In fact, they should be automorphic. There are no old forms, so to speak. There's no cusp forms coming from this, because a cusp form actually always has conductor degree at least four, turns out. OK, so in fact, these two are isomorphic. So again, you expect a correspondence. OK, so uh, I think I found it on the train this morning. <laughs> so, um, and I think maybe even a strategy for how to find it for whatever level structure you want. That would be nice. Um, but it, had to, it came down to this strange calculation I did that I still don't understand. And so I'm going to give you a formula for this space of Stuckas up there. So in fact, there's a, I, I'm interested in this space. 2, 1, plus 0, plus infinity. Okay. So this maps down to, so there's a Cartesian diagram here. And that's going to basically tell you exactly what the surface is. Um, so this is, so I, again, I found some strange parameter on it. So we already knew that this was fibered over P1 cross P1. But there's an additional parameter u. And then here's some map to p1 with some other parameter t. And this is something explicit. And the thing that goes here is it's the Dr Drinfeld modular curve at infinity with the level structure 2, 1 plus 0. And there's a map down here. So 
I'm thinking of this as the Drinfeld modular curve, and it's fibered over P1 T. T is the parameter on this, and that, that's what gets plugged into here. T has nothing to do with P or Q. T is some rational function in U, P, and Q. And as soon as I tell you it, then you know what the space of Struka's is. I have no idea where this came from. Um, no, everything's here is birational, and I, 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 and I, mean I can't. This is four dimensional. This is four dimensional, this is three dimensional, so this has relative dimension one. And this has relative dimension one. So we're happy, right? So uh, this tells you what the space is. And I even came up with a nice formula for this. I don't know if you like formulas. Here it is. <laughs> This PT was a choice? No, infinity. Infinity was a choice, yeah. Well, a choice, yeah. Right, well, I, mean, I could have put the zero up here and then put infinity here. <laughs> I, I suppose, there, yeah, I suppose there's a choice there. Um, yeah, where did my formula for this go? Da, 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 da. This time I really do need my notes, all right. So this thing right here, as a curve over here, it's a hyperelliptic curve. It's y squared equals ftx. Oh, yeah, I need q to be odd for this formula to work. There's a different formula when q is even. So y squared equals ft of x. What is this? So this is, oh boy, ah, x to the q plus 1 over 2 minus x minus 1 to the q plus 1 over 2 ah, ah, squared minus t ah, times <laughs> x to the q plus 1 over 2 minus x. But this time it's plus squared minus t. All right, whatever. There's your formula. <laughs> so it's some hyperelliptic curve of, of, you know, I think, you know, this thing has degree 2 times q. So the genus is q minus 1. All right, whatever. Uh, so for the record, I just fiddled with equations and this popped out. I don't, there, there must be some systematic mapping from here to here. I just don't know what it is. This is work in progress. When it concerns the jacquet langlands correspondence, there's a similar diagram for the other one, for the one with quaternions. So there's a similar diagram relating SHTD to, to 1 with another curve, x naught. Oh, where do I put the d? I don't know. d here? Still infinity. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so now this is just going to be 2, 1. And uh, um, this is, again, a hyperelliptic curve. It's y squared equals f1 minus t of x. OK. <laughs> so first, I found the equations y squared equals ft of x and y squared equals f1 minus t of x, and then I plugged in various values of t into magma, and the zeta functions were the same every single time. So that indicates that the Jacobians of these two curves are isogenous. I don't know how to do this directly. Maybe someone can figure out a very clever correspondence between this curve and that curve. But then in the train, I realized, yeah, this equation is actually the same as the equation for this. And we do know of a relationship between this curve and this curve. Their cohomologies are the same, and therefore Zarhin's result applies. The Jacob, there, is a, there is a correspondence between these two curves, and therefore there's a car that can be pulled back to a correspondence between this space of Stuckers and that one. So in this case, the sought-after cycle relating two spaces of Stuckers actually is known to exist. OK. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I don't know how general a phenomenon is, but it's probably, it probably generalizes beyond this very particular case, I would imagine. All right. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just end there. I have questions. Yeah. <laughs>